nice one all right well mate thanks for doing this um this is really cool you know keen to get more uh bjj guys to interview and um yeah, I mean, obviously you're on a big stage soon, and uh, yeah, it's great that you've taken the time out to talk to us. Oh no, thanks for having me. No, uh, I enjoy doing this. No, uh, well, man, I thought we'd just take it through. Um, I mean, I've looked you up a bit. I know, uh, you know, you've got a bit of background in catch wrestling and some other sports as well. So I thought maybe we'd talk about, you know, um, background in different martial arts. Uh, obviously, Polaris is coming up soon, so prep for that and how you feel for the competition then you know if you've got anything else you want to talk about or uh, anything moving forwards in the year yeah quick. yeah definitely so um yeah yeah man, i i guess if i start just um like how's it been over the past few months like getting prepped for competition uh i mean it obviously with like the circumstances um how they are at the minute it's a it's a little bit different but it's weird once you're kind of on the mat rolling it seems like you know everything could be fine it be sort of any other comp that I've had over the years. Um, it slightly changed the sort of uh, partners that I have access to, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, but it's also, in a way, it's also um, uh, sort of, uh, in a sense, refined down the partners I have as well. So, because of like the UKBJJ's like elite program and things. I find that the hours I'm spending rolling probably are less than I've had for previous comps, but they're purely with like the sort of A game competitor grade guys. Quality um, of a quantity, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, yeah, it's kind of yeah, yeah. So it's much sort of a sharper, sharper rounds. You haven't got, as you'd say, like rest rounds mixed in there, um, which isn't something I've necessarily over the years sort of. Um, really thought about like always you I, i'd always kind of had a mix like you know sometimes i i've used to use i i always had the mentality that i want to be on the mat you know more hours means sort of better so um mm -hmm. i'd often like have sessions where I'm like oh i'll roll with like easier rounds this time and so on but uh, with this it's been like short sharp shocks less sessions but each one is the sort of you know these sort of killers so um yeah it's, it's and good has, and has that changed how you're going to be preparing for competitions moving forwards because it sounds like you like this setup i do i do um yeah i think it will i think i will and especially like um it leaves more time for like the family and things mm -hmm. as well um whereas before i've often been in the gym i mean obviously like with the mm -hmm. teaching how it is and stuff um that's cut back a lot on that so a lot of the hours i used to spend in the gym were teaching but i'd often spend <clears throat> sorry, uh, like eight hours on the mat in a day um whereas now it's probably about two hours which uh is sort of a, quite a big change up in that so i think it's a lot more efficient and uh, i feel it's in a sense preparing me a lot better as well yeah i guess you're getting less broken down if you're not having to uh scramble to do a thousand things in a day yeah yeah because it's it's kind of like that chip chip not all the rounds because like i was saying it's more intense rounds but yeah it's like the volume before um and uh, yeah now i'm finding that i think it's getting me sort of peaking much better and mm -hmm. yeah like you say i'm not getting as worn down do you sort of um i mean how do you prepare for a competition you just mentioned peaking there do you sort of have a, a longer camp like because i know you've got the mma background and a lot of people from mma backgrounds you know there's a more of a camp whereas in jiu-jitsu people just train all year and sort of <laughs> in and out um yeah i'd say probably in the past i've kind of done a mix of both like um when i used to fight mma i, I kind of competed jiu-jitsu i just sort of slot them in as kind of extra practice sessions basically um and then as i got like to bigger tournaments and so on i, I did start applying that kind of camp to the jiu-jitsu um sort of um mindset as well so i prefer for it but um i'd say this is kind of probably has more of a camp feel because uh, like last year i competed i think it was 22 times so oh, wow. yeah so i was pretty much just you know in the training training in the gym a little bit of rest before comp comp but often i was had two three so like four like comps back to back Mm -hmm. I think I had one which was five weeks on the trot every weekend. Um, so yeah, for those that wasn't a camp, it was literally just yeah training and you get go into top comps. So um, definitely because of the reduction in the amount of 
been able to compete and the kind of stage it is, it's definitely had a feel like sort of MMA camps were at. And I think, I think definitely um, it's a positive. Like I think when you've got that sort of singular focus and you've gone, okay, I've got six weeks, I've got five weeks, whatever, I'm focusing on that. Um, I think you do arrive at it as a much more fine-tuned and sort of ready machine for it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also a big fan of, I love competing. So like, yeah, um, <laughs> as soon as this uh, COVID can uh, <laughs> bugger off, um, the, yep. you know, 22 comps in a year again. <laughs> Fair. But I think for performance-wise, camps make sense. So sort of as the stakes have got higher, you've moved more towards the camp side of things because, mm. I mean, I guess, you know, MMA fights are obviously fights as opposed to it, and there's a lot higher stakes. So I suppose that's why you used to do the camp for them. And as jiu-jitsu has become more and more important, you've moved over more towards the camp side of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think in a sense there's some parallels because, again, like when I started fighting amateur, I had quite a few times where I'd fight on like, I'd show up to a show, someone had pulled out and I'd end up fighting on like three, four hours notice. Yeah. Or occasionally I'd do a couple of weeks where I'd fight, like I didn't take damage in a fight and then I was offered another one. But yeah, like you say, as you get higher up the amateur rankings and then into pro, you do that same thing. I think that's kind of how I found it in jiu-jitsu as well. Like as you get to the bigger stages and the, um, uh, like shall we say, pay prices of success and failure are bigger, uh, you uh, commit more seriously to it. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And why is it you, um, I, I want to, you know, we'll come back to the jiu-jitsu in a second. I just wondered, why is it you, uh, it wasn't so long ago you quit MMA, right? Like two years ago? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's weird. Uh, for a long time, I didn't want to use, like, the idea that I'd quit. I was just like, oh, well, you know, uh, at first it was like, I, you know, I remember still the first time it came to a year since my first fight, which had always been fairly active. So um, I remember that time, but I was like, oh, I'm still, you know, I'm still active on the topology ranking. Like, well, and then it's, you know, gone two years and so on. Um, so for a long time, I didn't want to use the term quit. But um, to be honest, I'd literally lost the drive, the drive for MMA, really. I had um, counting amateur and pro, I had 41 fights. And um, I did like I was saying, where I had some on few hours notice back to back and th things, I took quite a lot of damage, especially in my amateur fights. Like mm -hmm. looking back, I feel I probably should either space it out a lot more, had a lot less amateur fights and all gone pro much earlier. Um, but I took a lot of damage and um, yeah, my body and mind just in the end weren't up to it. Like I think my last fight was on Bama, um, I think yeah. the show before, before it like folded. And um, I ended up getting a change of opponent, like um, on about on two days' notice. I was meant to fight uh, uh, Chris Meyer, who's like kind of a pressure striker, grappler, orthodox. And uh, on two days' notice, I got switched to Dominic Wooding, who um, is like a southpaw, a very elusive striker, um, who ended up knocking me out with a flying knee in the second round. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was quite bust up from that. I had like a um, very badly broken nose, um, tor um, torn. Um, intercostal uh what's it called uh, oblique which uh, caused me a lot of problems like I, I couldn't sleep um uh lying down i had to sleep in a chair for three days after that and um that that was the last one and um i was getting older as well and uh i just found the motivation to take another fight sort of it was sort of gone i'd kind of been feeling it fading like to be honest that fight i didn't train for it how i trained for a lot of my past mma fights like um i i was kind of i wasn't seeking out going to other gyms for the, the sort of rounds and stuff i was kind of sort of i was training a lot of jujitsu and focusing kind of close to home using like you know like excuses like oh well i've got to teach here later so going to like a new wave or something for the sparring session i, I can't do that and things but it was just i was starting to lose the motivation to put in the work that you need to fight at those levels really did you used to have like a key goal in mind like hit ufc level or what was it that went away um to be honest i stopped enjoying getting hit <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah which is well. always a bad sign um i mean i never i never got into mma or um fighting sports because of like getting to the UFC or anything like that I was always very sort of realistic about it and I, I did it mostly 
I'm, I was always intrigued in martial arts. I always loved different martial arts, always trained in them. And uh, the main thing with that was the experience, really. Uh, mm -hmm. I always liked the kind of idea is you want to try and have a life no one else has lived. Like you want to try and have as many experiences as possible. And um, then a couple along with that, because I was still kind of coming from a traditional background of my first few fights, was the idea that like how can i teach something if i haven't tested it and then the most like uh, appropriate way to test it in a lot of times was in sort of those kind of fights so um that's the first like k1 fight that i took mm -hmm. was basically from that yeah i get the um i get the sort of having a life like ha having some stories to tell i remember talking to them i've completely forgotten his name ahead of a uh, tenth planet uh london um and i remember james him, scott yes james scott i remember chatting to him on the mat and he just said um it's about sort of having stories to tell your grandkids because i said i'd do a couple and then maybe call it a day and he said yeah you've got stories to tell your grandkids and then um you just move on from it yeah yeah i mean a, a long time i was um i mean and i'm still in some way defining myself by the sport but yeah for a very long time i wouldn't have been able to imagine not having mma fights or uh, training mma um and to be honest i'd say probably the enjoyment of training mma started going first and that was kind of the prelude to no longer uh, having to drive to fight mma and um but yeah for a long time that was you know how i defined myself and um I get amazing jo enjoyment from it. I still remember like the feeling getting when you're walking out for a fight. I get like a tingle down my spine, and it almost feel, for want of a better word, like when once the bell rang out in the fight, uh, I felt like high, like I was like giddy. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and then I noticed probably the last sort of six to eight months of like fight, fighting and training MMA, kind of my last three fights. Well, last two fights definitely it just wasn't there anymore it, it just yeah it wasn't it, it wasn't quite happening um yeah it was kind of well it was my last it happened yeah it was like there's one fight in between my last four so like um that i did get the feeling back and it was a it was a good fight um uh, but yeah the like out of my last four fights like three of them it just wasn't it just wasn't a feeling how it used to Mm -hmm. yeah i mean you're lucky to have had that high feeling my normal feeling is uh what the hell am i doing with my life right before the cage closes but um yeah 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 <laughs> um i had that on my second fight i was literally picturing i was walking towards it bug eyes and i was like what would happen if i climbed over and ran away <laughs> right <laughs> i'm just always thinking like how did i end up here sometimes people are like why are you fighting i'm like i don't know i just started doing martial arts and ne ne next thing you know you're, you're in a cage sort of not knowing how you ended up in that spot just get swept along with it and end up somewhere um yeah but uh mate uh, so to bring it back a little bit to the jiu-jitsu the polaris side um well there's one that you mentioned with the mma that your opponent switched at the last minute um do you do that a lot to game plan for a specific specific opponent and do you do that with jiu-jitsu in jiu-jitsu um to a degree um i'd say it's probably something i've done less the more experience i've got kind of um i think i early on would more fixate on opponent strengths and um now i probably do it slightly less like i'm more focused on making sure i'm sort of very trying to sort of impose my game like um i'm quite um like obviously if someone's a big leg locker you're gonna be you know having more specific rounds and that kind of thing but mm -hmm. from the mo most point of view i i watch some film on people but generally it's more like a, a sort of broad overview of kind of certain positions they like but then mostly i'll put that out of my head and i'm mostly just focusing on really getting like um, strong and aggressively imposing my game mm -hmm. generally um, and um like again i i find almost uh, for sort of training specifically as well i won't necessarily like it's great if i have someone who emulates my opponent perfectly but that really happens anyway but i'll put more stock yeah. in having training partners who are real like competitors like grinders over someone who's specifically who i'm gonna fight but it's over 
like a, a, a slightly softer mentality if you mean like um one training partner of mine who uh recently came back in very very tough guy james uh, like a super skilled judo background before and now brown belt jiu-jitsu as well and um super tough like grind completely opposite game to most of the guys i fight like mm -hmm. you know he's like a takedown guy a smash boss um but it doesn't give an inch like even if you're beating him it's exhausting like it you know it's it's just those grinds um so i'll take that over having someone who's maybe got a similar like uh, leg lock game or um z guard game to a guy i'm fighting but kind of folds after at a certain pressure so i'll often put a lot more stock in uh, that kind of thing getting like a real sort of uh, comp sort of way of fighting someone who doesn't give up because that's that's kind of the biggest thing at this level not just the technical ability but the mentality of all the people at that you know they come to win and if you're rolling with guys who kind of they you know oh he's pretty much got the pass it's getting a bit uncomfortable and they fold a little bit even if they're similar to who you're fighting it's like i'll put it more on the idea that i'm getting used to fighting someone whose will doesn't break mm, okay yeah so it's more about it's, it's kind of mental conditioning over setting up specific skill sets to beat a particular opponent. Yeah, yeah. I, I put a lot of stock in that. Mm, okay. Uh, and, and I guess it does strike me that obviously it's harder to game plan for specific opponents because you don't know who you're going to fight. Yeah. Got, how, many, how many other a team? There's eight? Eight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah. you could end up with anyone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, you could... Uh, yeah, you get, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, any one of them will be a very good match, but, mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're all got different games, different sizes, different styles. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, kind of, uh, perfect in the, the sort of approach of, yeah, if I fixate on one person, it's definitely not going to help me in this case. Of course. Yeah. And is there anyone you want to fight in particular? Um, Again, I'm fairly, I, I like the idea of fighting some of the bigger guys. Mm -hmm. I'd love to fight like Tess Rios. Um, I, I generally enjoy playing against bigger opponents as well. Um, so I'd, I'd find that, I'd, I'd, I'd really enjoy that. But I'm trying not to have too many like uh, preconceived notions where they're just because of the unpredictability of who I might fight. But um, I'm definitely looking forward to like uh, testing against some of the like big guys. I yeah. want to see like, because again, like um, always in absolute divisions and things, I've done um, well, but against like elite level big guys, that that would be. Uh, I think that would be quite a fun test. Yeah, I mean, I, I always think there's something about the absolute. I mean, obviously, there's weight classes and everyone's completely legitimate. But there's something about being the the best, no matter. What the rules say. Yeah. There's something about that. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that'd be cool if you um see, see yourself as a bit of a Lachlan Giles, Giant Slayer type of guy, maybe coming in. Yeah, and that's three points for the team as well. So that would <laughs> that would be handy. <laughs> yeah. On that subject, like, what do you think of the whole rule set for the next Polaris? I mean, it's a bit unique. Um, I, I really, I really like it actually. Um. I mean, as soon as it uh, was kind of sort of starting to appear, uh, I hoped that I'd be selected for it. But I kind of, in my head, I'd assumed it would follow a kind of fairly standard quintet style format. Um, but the way that it's done, I actually like even more because um, it gives like the opportunity for a lot more matches. And I think it also gives an opportunity for kind of a, a better narrative from a viewing perspective as well. Um, because you can see people face off multiple times throughout it. You can see sort of um, what the defeat, defeat and redemption. And, you know, you can get quite, um, I think, a lot of different looks with it, uh, especially on the fact that, you know, you get to feel out game people's games as well. I mean, um, in a sense, I think, especially with the caliber of people, I wouldn't be surprised if at first some of the initial, ma quite a lot of the initial matches are draws. because five minute time limit it's not a massive amount of time when you're getting people mm -hmm. who you know are very skilled 
Um, but I think in the later on matches, when you're seeing people fight for a second time, or maybe even the third time, you're going to start seeing who's making the better adaptions from their experience with uh, the opponent. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like, I, I like it a lot. I like what you said about the, um, the redemption the story aspect of it, because I do think the team aspect, uh, it, it almost provides better viewing in the fact that the team aspect's cool. You get someone repeatedly coming on, but also one thing I noticed with the quintet matches is that you got some really one-sided matches. Like if you had the really big guy versus the really small guy, uh, and it's kind of unfair, but also it's good entertainment. It's it's entertaining, yeah, 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 yeah. And it creates a kind of underdog feel. Yeah, quite a lot, and one that's very visually um, understandable, even if you don't really know who the competitors are. Mm -hmm. It's like as soon as you see a big guy versus little guy, straight away got that kind of underdog dynamic going on. Yeah, um, of course. So yeah. coming into this, do you have, um, I mean, you've, you say you have a kind of a broad overview. Do you have a specific style that you're planning on using against certain people or is there just one certain style you use? <sighs> so I think I saw um, you first at uh, Battle Grapple 6, which is a very different match to... Um, uh, the last Polaris one, you played very differently. Yeah, I think uh, if that was Battle Grapple, that would have been a Gi match, I think, because mm -hmm. I've only done Gi on there. Yes. Um, yeah, was that, was that my one with, um, was it uh, any, uh, or was that the one with Dinu? Uh, Dinu. Uh, Dinu. I, I, I okay. might have seen you at both. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, one of the brown belt and well, brown belt one I won, a black belt one I lost with Dino, which actually that will that'll be quite interesting as well because he's he's in this, so I'd like to get redemption there as well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, yeah, the, those ones I have a very different game, no gi to gi. Like I'm okay. predominantly a no gi player, really. Um, gi gi something that I've always done and had it's like my foot in and uh, my coach Yusuf is always like um, is very uh, big proponent of training the gi and you ne never get grades with him unless you've been putting in the hours in the gi and competing in it um, so uh, that's always a big thing with that but yeah primarily my uh, skill set is mostly no gi like um, the games of Kind of, there's some similarities with it, but it's, it's very different. And uh, I'm, I prefer competing no gi, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm much better at no gi, uh, generally speaking, as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the techniques I use cross over, but just with the you're able to wrestle much better in uh, the no gi as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I think uh, also with the Ross match. That was kind of a project of the, as we were talking earlier, the, uh, a lot to do with the, how the training camp of lockdown had kind of forced me to develop in certain ways. So there were a lot of uh, new things that had developed this year, um, mm -hmm. thanks to like being pocketed in with uh, various sharks that I've been training with. And like basically, my main training partners were going to always be like, Yusef every day and like John Hathaway so I was getting like um, very high level intense rounds all the time and uh, I think a lot of that showed new developments in my game which made it a lot more dynamic and also the force of uh, like <laughs> lockdown made me put a lot more time into my strength and conditioning as well so I was able to maintain a much higher pace as well I feel. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah because you came in extremely aggressive to that one, and it, that was a really fun match, actually. I really liked that. And obviously, uh, you know, I know you lost, but if it was a normal Polaris, uh, again, maybe Ross would have played differently. Uh, yeah. you, you know, you have to take that into account. But normal yeah, Polaris, totally. that sort of style, that you know, that, you know, probably would have given it to you, and that was really fun to watch. So if it's more of that, I'll be excited in the next one. <laughs> Yes, yeah, no, no, I definitely plan on playing this aggressively. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was there, yeah, that was a very fun match. It was, it's one of the first few ones when you can say from a loss, I probably wouldn't do anything different. Like, uh, there wasn't really regrets in it. It was, uh, and especially like against Ross, who in the past, like, um, well, uh, certainly the very first time I fought him, I felt like I'd kind of psyched myself out beforehand. Um, a bit but, yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, the very first time I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was new brown belt and uh, kind of shocked that, uh, 
yeah, I was in the same category. And uh, then I, sure enough, I had a, but uh, actually, uh, he he came up to me and was like, um, oh, good luck today, Dom. And I was like, oh, he knows my name. Shit, he knows my name. <laughs> uh, it was like one of those moments and he was he kept telling me like oh we're the first match so i'm like psyching myself up god i've got, got ross first match got ross first match and then they call my name I'm like, oh this is it <laughs> i'm called against some com completely different american <laughs> oh, no. and i was like so yeah yeah so it was, it was suddenly like oh uh, and i was so keyed up from thinking i was going to fight ross that i ended up darsing this guy in like 35 seconds <laughs> and then i fought ross and he fucked me up <laughs> oh well but you've uh, fought him again between then and the last Polaris as well. Yes, yes. So um, the second time I fought him was, I think it was about two weeks before I got my black belt. And it was at Grappling Industries. Uh, it was a m much better fight from the point that I didn't get submitted, mm -hmm. uh, which I think I was, I think if I remember right, I was the only person he didn't submit that day. But um, it was still like a 9 nil uh, win for him. Um, but it was like... Yeah, I, I, would, I think I was, I definitely wasn't as starstruck, but of course, of course it was still Ross Nichols. Um, but I, learnt, I had some things from that match to like work on, which had kind of been going over um, in my he head, basically since then, because he was oftentimes, I didn't always get to fight him, but he was oftentimes in divisions that I was entering. So mm -hmm. he was always in the back of my mind as having to like kind of prepare for him. And obviously, you know, if you're wanting to be anywhere near the best in the UK, Ross is on, and that's your weight class. Well, even if it isn't, Ross is like always uh, on your radar. So um, a lot of what I was able to use in the match that caused him some problems um, were things that had been like, kind of in my head grinding over after each fight with him mm -hmm. when was that was that the first uk grappling industries or uh it wasn't the first one i think it was the second i think it was the second i was i was in the same division as him at the first uk grappling industries but we didn't end up fighting mm. ah fair enough yeah yeah wow. they were good I think, yeah, I, yeah 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 <laughs> but is yes I, I really like grappling industries format because uh, you, you get so many fights <laughs> Yeah, they're great fun. I, I I really like the um, I like the way they set up the rules with it as well. Uh, like letting you have more leg locks, um, even at the lower levels. I mean, because mm. I, uh, well, I, I uh, originally trained doing leg locks a lot with uh, MMA guys back at White yeah. Belt. So you know, I'll probably get some hate for that doing heel hooks at White Belt. But then when I actually came <laughs> doing proper jujitsu, and everyone takes that away from you, I was like, I was a bit disappointed almost. So it was nice yeah. to get back to it at uh, Grappling Industries. <laughs> yeah no no i think it, it's um yeah no i think i think it's kind of the future of a lot of tournaments that are just going to become easier with that i mean mm -hmm. again it's like the same thing i started off grappling in mma gyms and uh actually i think one of my first gi classes i accidentally popped a mate of mine chris may's uh, foot with a heel hook and got yelled at by the coach yeah but, like not a bad pop but um but Chris might disagree. I don't know. Uh, Just a little walk. innocent. You can still pop. walk. <laughs> yeah, a little innocent pop. A little innocent pop. But um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. It was. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, probably similar for you as well. A lot of the MMA gyms back then were a bit wild west. It was like someone who you know watched a few v VHSs or whatever, and they're <laughs> teaching some grappling in a garage someplace. But, Something like um, that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what's the deal with you and, because um, I know you, you won the catch wrestling, well, well I, I don't know if it was the biggest catch wrestling world championship or if it was, like, I don't know if you were top of the game in 2018? Yeah, 2018. Um, that was, I think, to be honest, the first, like, uh, tournament that started getting me noticed quite a bit. I got, like, a Grapple Fest uh, invite off that and a few, several, quite a few other things. Um, I mean, it's it's like uh, it's run by the Snake Pit, which is like kind of the I suppose really the sort of home of catch wrestling. Um, the Wigan one, or yeah, yeah, yeah. the Wigan uh, yeah. Snake Pit, and um, like uh, Roy, who runs that now, is like learnt under Billy Riley, so it's got quite a, a very good lineage. So in a way, they've considered themselves like the uh, sort of biggest catch wrestling. But obviously, there's some uh, there's a lot in the states as well, mm. like the USA yeah. Snake Pit um that run theirs as well um i mean for me what uh always gives a tournament sort of legitimacy and stuff is depends on who you've fought in it um and it was it was kind of a mixed 
in the division. Uh, I got to fight um, Ian Bromley in his last wrestling match before he passed, uh, rest in peace, um, which obviously was a legend from a point of view of that. But uh, then I also got a match against um, a uh, black belt under Josh Barnett, who was over with actually uh, uh -huh. Josh Barnett in his corner. Um, which was uh, that was um, Victor Henry, who uh, is also he's currently a number six bantamweight in the world in MMA, and the deep he's on rising for a title shot at the minute. But oh, really? uh, yeah, yeah. So he he was he was uh, he was very legit. He was my final match of the day, and to be honest, I thought I I was quite uh, I was a brown belt at the time. I think I was two stripes, and uh, I I was. Uh, like uh, I was quite worried <laughs> finding that John Hathaway was cornering me. He's like, yeah, oh, you go for it, go for it. But yeah, you've got Josh Burnett in his corner. He's come flown over from the States for this. Uh, Black belt, he was like a Gracie Cup national. US, he was in the USA Snake Pit um, national champion as well at the time. So um, I went out with the kind of idea that I was just going to be aggressive and put on a show kind of thing. Like, uh, you know, a match that I wouldn't be ashamed to watch back. And I ended up hitting a single and then cradling him off it. And I ended up catching him and submitting him with a Kimura within 56 seconds. Um, so that was, that was probably the, that winning that title, but more so winning that match. And the way I did was sort of the first kind of thing that got me, started getting me noticed on the sort of professional grappling scene. Mm -hmm. um, nice. And, uh, but then have you trained um, sort of, I mean, I guess in the run up to that, you would have trained specifically cat wrestling, but, do you have a history of training cat wrestling over Jiu Jitsu or is it just bundled into one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have a very eclectic background in grappling because, like, where I started in Norfolk at the time, there wasn't really Jiu Jitsu schools. You had, like, people, like, you had a smattering, a couple of blue belts around. Um, more so, you had quite a lot of judo guys that were kind of transitioning into, like, sort of no holds bars style grappling and some MMA fights and things. But it was all fairly sort of a rough around the edges. So there were a lot of different kind of, uh, I, I've started using the uh, reference kind of left field grappling. So it's like a lot of um, kind of sort of funky stuff, like, uh, you know, sort of Americanas from bottom side control type things. Um, and uh, a lot of my early grappling was with uh, various judo guys, where a lot of my arm wraps, which developed into my, my Kimura attacks and things, started from really, was from uh, people like um, sorry, uh, Brian and Nigel that I used to train with, who were like old school, like uh, um, sort of uh, judo guys who'd been doing it for like 40 years and stuff, and just uh, gnarly. Um, and then there, there were some, um, catch influences that I had as well as like uh, I think the only like proper catch coach that I've done any training with was Graham Yates that mm -hmm. I did a bit with at a club that I also taught at occasionally um, but uh, yeah generally it's just been uh, a lot of kind of slightly um, like Sambo guys I, I did quite a lot of training with like Sambo guys in the area that was kind of sort of some of the more legitimate grapplers that I could get in practice with because uh, at that point I was just transitioning from like traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu which while it had some elements that were closer to judo it also had a lot of like you're gonna throw a punch I'm gonna catch it and twist it and press a pressure point yeah yeah um yeah so it was kind of like uh yeah and um it was sort of like you train with whoever had a bit of realistic like nous about them really yeah I mean I feel like um how long ago was that because obviously you started a while before me. I feel like before my time, um, it was just kind of what you could find. And mm. the UK scene has evolved just from random little so patches. Much. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally, totally. I mean, it's, um, to be honest, it's not going back a huge amount of time, but um, uh, it's, it's just that particular area as well. Like it's quite far from London. Like in London, you had to, you know, the proper gyms and uh, quite a few black belts and things, but that area just w hadn't really spread to there. Now it's started to pick up and there's quite a few black belts that teach down there now. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it was uh, probably, I guess, I guess like originally, cause I've always been kind of trying, when I first started sort of movement into some kind of grappling arts and stuff, probably going back like, 
sort of 12, 15 years or so. But then when I actually started, like, that was still when I was kind of in the, like, traditional martial arts mostly, like mm -hmm. Japanese jiu-jitsu and things. And then when I started moving into, like, trying to look at it from for sort of MMA and grappling competitions, you're probably talking more like 2012 kind of time. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, as I say, that area particularly just hadn't kind of, like, cities like London and stuff were, and uh, Nottingham and Birmingham and things were much further advanced in the terms of the quality of training you could get. Yeah. At the time, yeah, I, mean, I guess it spread out a bit more. It was a, uh, it was never going to reach those those areas that early on, anyway. No, no, exactly, yeah, yeah. Unless you're ridiculously lucky and have like some Brazilian move in, who's in next door, and you just train in his backyard and become like a black belt without knowing it. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Miyagi style. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, well, I don't want to keep you too long, so I just think we uh, move back to the. Polaris bit I mean um have you like uh, chatted to any of the guys about it like have you because I know it's a team event but also you you work separately I mean how is that uh how does that work have you prepared with anyone else for it yeah not not as yet really no I mean again just because of locations of a lot of people's gyms I know some of them I kind of I know Bradley Hill was down Ashley Williams place and was doing some training there uh, and I know quite a few of the team Europe are in similar similar gyms uh, or nearby gyms but yeah just just got a location where we are on Brighton things uh, it hasn't really happened um, but yeah i mean again if these kind of team events happen in future and also at the minute it's a bit weird sometimes with moving from gym to gym with everything and yeah um but yeah i think if these kind of events happen in future it'd be cool to sort of organize team training and things i think that would be quite a good thing yeah we've got we've got a group chat where we have to like choose things like the walkout song and stuff <laughs> nice okay you get yeah anything good coming up or is it going to be a surprise <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I'm not actually sure what was decided. There were a lot of different things thrown out. There's a lot of different music tastes, as you could imagine. Uh, Mumford and Sons was in the running quite a bit. Um, I suggested, because I was a Mirka Krokop fan, uh, Wild Boys, uh, <laughs> which went down like a lead balloon. But uh, um, Never mind. Yeah, so yeah, there was quite a few, I think uh, Jed uh, Bugsy Malone suggested. Uh, yeah, so a lot of different things. I'm not 100% sure on actually what was chosen in the end. <laughs> I'll mm -hmm. be surprised with everyone else. No worries. Um, and for the rest of the year, I mean, obviously that, uh, you know, Polaris is a week and a half away. Um, what happens after that? Got much lined up? Uh, yeah, so um, we've actually got, oh, um, Yusef has been um, working to put on um, a, a submission called Submission Series in uh, Brighton. So um, that's that's afterwards. That's on uh, October twentieth. So uh, mm -hmm. that'll be the next thing that I get on there. So that's that's quite an exciting um, format. It's a bit different to a lot of uh, competitions out there at the minute, and it's uh, it's also going to be kind of a sort of um, sort of eight man bracket with some pretty good names in it, which I think will be announced over the next few days. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's 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 going to be my next thing after Polaris. Nice one. Well, um, I'll keep an eye out for it. So, yeah, Polaris is Southampton, right? So, yeah, going, yes. all, along, going all along the coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly. Well, yeah. mate, um, is there anything else you wanted to talk about while uh, while you're on um, before we wrap it up? <laughs> uh, put me on the spot. Uh, uh, to be honest, with these kind of ones, I always blank out. I was mean to say something, but uh, I think maybe um, just to thank uh, Progress for uh, recently. Uh, sponsoring me with a lot of kit and for Polaris uh, in particular, which um, yeah, has, has been a great help uh, stopping me from uh, wearing my uh, decades old uh, Valetudos. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Well, um, hey, well, thank you so much for doing this. Um, we'll try and get it up tomorrow night. Uh, I'll send you the link when it's up and uh, best of luck. Cheers, cheers. Thanks for having me on. No worries at all. Cheers, man. Bye. Bye. Bye.